Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Alhas, and with me here today, I have Team 11970, Team Titanium Talents from Woodenville, Washington. They competed recently in the Washington Bardeen League Meet 1, where they went undefeated, going 6-0, and ending with an OPR of just under 110, placing them 9th in the world. Today, I have Krish, Neha, Skyler, and Kevin, who are going to talk about the robot, ranging from everything from the drivetrain to the deposit, lift, intake, and strategy as well as software. They did extremely well last year, and it looks like they're geared and ready to go to do extremely well this year again. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com slash FIRST to register your team. So guys, why don't we start off talking about your drivetrain. Uh, last year when you competed in Freight Frenzy, there was a large barrier on the field which prevented a lot of like traditional drivetrain designs I would say, or forced teams to think about a lot of different drivetrains. But this year the field is much more open with the exception of those ground junctions. So how did that change your drivetrain strategy? What does your drivetrain look like now and how has it been performing? Um, our drivetrain is still a uh, Mechnum, which we took from inspiration from the Clueless Dead Axle Mechnum drive over summer. Um, when we used that to inspire our bot this year, which we actually began prior to the game even being released. Um, we created a CAD model of the uh, chassis with a set angle and element manipulator and modified it to create our chassis this year. Mm -hmm. And did you guys decide to go with an 18-inch drivetrain or much shorter? Or like, how did you guys decide how wide and long to make your drivetrain? Um... Are currently we are within the 18 inch limit and we originally had it uh, a lot shorter just so that we could easily maneuver it across the field mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense and uh, do you guys have any plans to make changes to your drivetrain or just everything has been working super well so far this season so far everything's been working super well okay fantastic let's go on to the next part of your robot which will be your claw uh, i think Claw designs are one of the most versatile things this year. Teams seem to be coming up with a hundred different designs and they all work super well. Can you guys walk me through your guys' claw design, any iterations you've made and some things that you think are super cool? So we originally started our claw design by making it out of dough builder parts, but the problem that we had was that we weren't able to grab it a cone against the wall. So we created a hinge right here so that when the cone when the grabber comes up and hits against the wall, it'll wrap around the cone, and the color sensor in the back will sense the cone and link, lift the linkage up. However, this design can also be used for just normal cones. For instance... Oh, wow. And so, how has this design changed throughout the season? I know you guys said you originally started with... Uh trying to make a go build a like commercial off the shelf claw and then you guys went over to this design that looks like it uses 3d printed parts as well as custom components uh what like what are some iterations that you went through with it um so well with our claw itself we've been through a lot of iterations so first we started with this just being like a well we started in just go build a parts to make like a simple version of it and this was just a straight like piece of metal and it wasn't able to bend. And then that's where we found the problem with the autonomous period. And so we began to come up with this idea. And we also, for the back of the claw, we added this top part because we found that earlier it was like the cone wouldn't always pick up straight. It would sometimes be bent in random directions. And that would mess up both autonomous and uh, teleop. And so we added this extra part on top to make sure it stays straight when mm -hmm. it grabs. Awesome, yeah, and uh, you know, as you guys grabbed the claw, one of the fastest components probably of your robot was your arm. It just swung right up. So what went into the design of that? How did you guys decide like the different lengths it would be and all of those and how it would be actuated? Uh, you know, talk me through that. Yeah, so we use a virtual four bar linkage for our arm. And so this allows us to just wrap all the way back around to the back and have a through design for our robot and make scoring faster. 
And so we power this by using two Axon Minis on each side. And funny story, originally we had an Axon Max, but we ended up breaking one of those and we didn't have any extras and they were out of stock. So we switched to this design very fast because it was a few weeks before competition. And we just use a 30 to 42 gear reduction for the Axon Minis. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And are those the Minis or the Mini Pluses? Like, are you guys using the analog out feature or is it just purely as a traditional servo? No, these are just purely as traditional servos. I see. That's awesome. And I think uh, one thing that teams have faced as a challenge when running a virtual four bar design with a claw is that uh, when you pick up the cone, the claw, or when you pick up the cone, the claw tends to be behind the cone. Uh, but when you go to deposit the cone, the claw is now uh, still behind the cone in such a way that it blocks your robot from immediately going forward past the pole. Does that make sense? Yes, and so kind of. Is that something that you guys faced as an issue, or uh, have, has that not been something that's influenced your guys' driving strategy or game at all? Well, so this is these are our arms when it's scoring on the low pole, and so mm -hmm. this is it when it's back. And we use a, well, with our slides, we've slow, slightly angled them to just get a little bit more extension outwards to kind of help with that. And here you go and drop it. Yeah. And then it just comes back to pick back up. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, you guys talked about a slight angle on your slide, so let's just go over to your slide mechanism. Uh, what type of slides are you using? Did you guys do any prototyping in previous seasons, or is this, like, something that you've explored new this season, and what's working well with your slides? Well, so for our slides, we use two three stacks of 400 uh, millimeter long robotic slides, and we power these with two go build -a motors that run to winches, and so... We have a, uh, on each side, we use a return string to help with keeping the tension throughout, and we have a continuous uh, string. Mm -hmm. Got it. And have you guys done any testing on, like, uh, ideal pulley size for your slides or ideal motor ratio or, like, how fast you should run it and things like that? Or did you guys just happen to find, like, that right pulley size uh, on day one and haven't really had a need to change it from, since then? Yeah, so we've gone through a bunch of different pulley sizes. Um, we originally began with a smaller one that was, like, it was, we started, we originally didn't have the return string, we just had one smaller pulley. And that, the string would come undone, and so we added a second pulley onto it, which added the return string. And then we found that, that it didn't really work for us, so we switched to the, um, the Go build -a, the one that Go build -a supplies mm -hmm. for a slightly thinner ones so we had more room in the chassis itself and that worked well and we just thought we could with using the design we have right now we could maximize our um, stringing yeah no that sounds great and i think uh, we should definitely move on to your guys software because a team that's as high scoring as yours doesn't have only fantastic hardware but just very very uh robust and well-tuned software and so one thing that I really want to focus on is sensors and how you guys use sensors throughout your robot to make sure all of your functions are very consistent and robust. And so I know we saw the color distance sensor in your claw. And so if you could expand that, expand on that a little bit more, do you guys use just the color functionality, just the distance functionality, some combination of the both? And, you know, how does it work? So we actually use both when sensing for the cone. So originally, we put the cone right in front, and then it senses for distance. And then once it's grabbed the cone, then it checks color, because before we had the issue where it would check for distance, but then there were some false grabs, such as like if the uh, claw part of the grabber grabbed and there was no cone there, then if it was checking for distance, then the, claw would, the arm would still go up. So instead, now we check for distance, and then afterwards, we check for color, if it's either above a red value or above a blue value, then that allows us to know if we have a cone or not, and then we move the linkage up and get ready for scoring. 
Yeah, awesome. That's definitely smart to combine both the color and distance features to just make sure you really, really know when you have cloth. And do you use the same sensor for depositing? Like, how is that integrated into your uh, scoring sequence? So when we score, we actually just basically we keep sensing if we have the cone and then eventually at the end so once we've lifted the slides and then when we're depositing we just constantly check and then we just release the grabber and then it goes back and then it brings itself down and we're checking if we have blue or red still and if we still do have blue or red it will not bring the linkage completely down it'll keep it up so that we can go to score again so Basically, this year we run slides with encoders, so we use the built-in motor encoders. Um, we had originally attempted to use PID with the slides, but the thing with our slides is that to run them to position fast enough, we can just run them at um, 1, like we can set their power to 1. So we don't necessarily need um, PID for each of the slides. Um, and then we also experimented with um, feed, feed forwards and an ID implementation to keep the slides at the position. And we started with a feed forward, just basically passively setting power. And that seemed to work well enough for us. Eventually, we also tried an ID, but that kind of um, was an experiment in the making, and we didn't need to use it. Got it. We, use, we actually use our camera um, to look back through the robot. So we initially had our camera on here for the sleeve, for the signal sleeve, um, so we could measure, or so we could know what position to park in. And we, one night we kind of just, it was kind of, it was kind of funny. We just had this crazy idea like the night before League One. What if we use the camera to look back at the cones? Wow. Um, so we, um, and, and orient ourselves to them. So we're, we're able to do that, and the camera can draw sort of an outline around the cone and find the center of it. That's just, that's very, very impressive. And have you guys had any issues, like, with the CV detection and, like, the algorithm, or has it just been smooth sailing all around? So it did take us a little while to, to figure out exactly how to do it. So initially, we were using this camera, like, the, the, fir the initial reason that we put this camera on a servo in the first place was that we were having some inconsistencies with scoring cones on the poles during auto, like our, our preload and as well as the stack cones. And we realized that we could use the, or we thought of the idea of using the camera to look up at the poles and f find out where they are in the image so that we could orient ourselves to score correctly on the pole wow. instead. So, And are, yeah. do you guys still do that in autonomous or have you uh, decided on a different method? Uh, yes, we still absolutely do. So we do both of we do both the cone normalization and the pole normalization during auto. Wow, that's that's just fantastic. Uh, I mean, this robot is already so amazing that it's hard to see like how one could improve on this without just you know practice, practice, practice. But do you guys have plans for future improvements before your next uh, competition? So yeah, we're actually working. We're working on. Uh, we do have a new. Um, an, an entirely new robot that we're working on right now where we're just sort of um, decreasing the slide angle to get more outward extension. And then as far as this design goes, we're mostly working on optimizing auto so if we can't get our robot done in time. Um, we'll be trying to squeak out sort of maybe a one plus four. So at league two or at league one or our first meet, we only had a sort of inconsistent one plus three and we're working so we're working with the camera again to try to squeak out a one plus four yeah i mean that's fantastic i think bardeen league is one of if not the most competitive leagues in the world i mean you guys just have top teams every single year competing there uh and it really drives everyone to be just a little bit better and score a little bit more with their robots i think this interview has been very very insightful uh team titanium talents you guys always have so much to talk about and uh, build amazing robots year after year. So thank you very much. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm a bus. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. SOLIDWORKS is free for first teams. Over 80% of US engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com first to register your team.
At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.